Hey guys. So, uh, finally came up with another clean army story. And this has to do with the towel of soldiering. So, back in the 90s, I was in a military unit in Germany that uh, fought as the bad guys against NATO. We were called an Op 4 unit or opposing force unit. And we would uh, hide in the hills of Germany and attack NATO units as practice, you know, so the NATO units get used to fighting against uh, Soviet tactics or, Russia, say, Russian tactics at the time. Well, at the time I was an anti-tank gunner, and I carried a large anti-tank weapon, I carried a concrete landmine, I carried a, a simulated mortar round, it was basically uh, a tube, a, a container that was filled with sand. One of the first things I would do is I'd dump the sand out of it, put my cigarettes in there, <laughs> close it back up, you know. Uh, I carry my personal gear. I was carrying a lot of weight. At the time, I was 155 pounds, 5 foot 10. You know, I, I was a skinny kid. I was carrying all this stuff. Now, one of the guys in the unit, his name was Smitty. Now, this guy... You know, he had said that he was, uh, he had been a New York City firefighter. I mean, who knows, right? Like, it was, it was back in the 90s. You couldn't, you didn't have the internet to verify that stuff, right? But, uh, he was short, you know, kind of built like a fire plug. And, uh, big hands, you know. And he was our machine gunner. And he loved shooting that machine gun. But he hated carrying it. And he hated carrying the ammunition. And he would vocalize this whenever he got a chance. One day we were out in the box, we are out in our training area, and uh, for some reason my squad leader wasn't with me. Or no, my team leader wasn't with me that day. The squad leader was there, the other team leader was there. And so uh, Smitty was acting, you know, this, this machine gunner, Smitty was acting as our, um, as our team lead. Well, we were moving from one hilltop to another hilltop, and... Uh, my uh, squad leader went to do a leader's recon. So he took him and the alpha team leader, and he told Smitty, you're in charge. And he left to go do his leader's recon of this area that we were going to go occupy. And uh, as soon as he left, Smitty looks at me, and he goes, Hey, Macbeth, uh, I need you to carry some of my ammunition. I need you to crossload. I ain't doing that. I'm already carrying enough crap. Now, at the time, he was a specialist, and I was a private private E2. Like, I had no rank, you know? Everybody else outranked me. Everyone else in the squad outranked me. And this guy who was a specialist was sort of like a senior private, essentially, right? So, he's telling me to take his ammo. I'm like, I'm not doing that. And a couple of the guys were like, oh, freaking Blue Falcon, you're gonna make Macbeth uh, take your stuff. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what Blue Falcon means. You can Google it. This is a family channel. But it means something that's not so nice. Calling someone a blue falcon is a, is a pretty big insult. So, I told him, I'm not doing that. And he hemmed and hawed about it. Oh, I'm a specialist, you're a private. Whatever, right? So, the squad leader, team leaders come back. We go, we occupy the assembly area. Now, that night, I remember it was freezing cold. It was your October, November in Germany. It was cold. And when you're out in the field, you just can't get warm sometimes, you know? So, who do they give the worst guard shift to? Always the newest pride, which was me. So, my guard shift was between 3 and 4 in the morning. It, that's the worst shift because you don't get enough sleep. You get woken up in between, and then you got to go back to sleep again. You're still tired when you wake up. So, I was woken up by whomever, and they handed off their night vision goggles, right? I get up, and I'm like, man, this freaking sucks. It's cold. I want to get back in my warm sleeping bag. This sucks. And an idea hits me. If I start smoking, maybe NATO will see the heat from the cigarette and drop some fake artillery rounds on our position. And if we all get killed, then we get to go back to the warming tents for 12 hours. You gotta use the big brain, right? 
got to use that head for more than a hat rack. So I go back to my backpack and take out the mortar round tube. I take out my cigarettes. I start smoking cigarettes. Finish a cigarette, flick it, light up another cigarette. I must have smoked six cigarettes in the cold. Kept me warm, kept me awake, kept me alert. I'm hoping that NATO sees me, right? They never saw me. They're probably just as cold huddling in their own sleeping bags, you know, hoping they get killed so they can go back to the warming tents. So, I finish my shift. I go wake up my relief. I hand off the night vision device. I go back to sleep. Zero five in the morning comes. Now, stand to is a military term. Stand to. It essentially means everybody gets up. And you have stand to early in the morning before the sun comes up because dawn is usually when the bad guys attack. So you want 100% security. Everyone needs to be up and ready to go. So normally when you're doing stand to, everyone's very quiet because you know, it's early in the morning, the air is more dense, sound carries further, so you want to be quiet when you're setting up. And I hear this voice echoing off the hills of Germany. I hear, what the hell? 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 It was Smitty. There's cigarette ash in his hair. And about six holes, six burn holes in his sleeping bag from Parliament cigarettes. He starts screaming. My squad leader runs over to him like, shut up, shut up. What's, you know, what's going on? And he's so much, so much ash in my hair and what burn holes in my sleeping bag. Well, they just look at the, the cigarette butts, and it says Parliament. There's only one guy in the squad who smokes Parliaments. So everyone looks at me. My squad leader comes over like, you know, like, did you see smoking on guard duty last night? Yes, sir. Did you burn, put burn holes in Smitty's uh, sleeping bag? I didn't mean to, sorry. I'll deal with you later. And that is the last thing you ever want to hear. I'll deal with you later. So you know something creative, some kind of creative punishment is coming, right? So she'll Smitty was a jerk the rest of the the rest of the day. And then other guys started getting on him because they thought I had intentionally flicked cigarettes on him. I didn't know he was under me. It was dark. Night vision wasn't that good back then, but I I had flicked cigarettes. They had put burn holes in the sleeping bag. He had signed for that sleeping bag. He's gonna have to turn it back in with burn holes in it. <sighs> Guys are starting to make fun of him because he was a blue falcon. He tried, they thought I had done it intentionally because Smitty wanted me to carry his ammunition. And word started to get around the squad of what he had done, including back to my squad leader. Now, I didn't say anything to my squad leader. I, I ain't no rat. I didn't take care of my own problems. But my squad leader must have heard what he had tried to do with me. A couple days later, the exercise is over, we get out of the box. Whenever we come back in, we have to wash all of our equipment. There are these long sinks. There's one base in Hunsfeld's Germany. We have to scrub all of our equipment. You're getting all the mud out of it, you know, when we come back in. And so we were at the wash sinks. Guys are just, now word had gotten all around the platoon that Smitty had, had tried to get me to carry his ammo and he was a Blue Falcon. And so people are like, oh, you're trying to get me back to carry your ammo, you Blue Falcon. And, oh, Smitty's getting madder and madder and he's scrubbing his gear, getting madder and madder. And he's saying to me, Beth, you owe me a new sleeping bag. <laughs> Whatever, man. I did that intentionally. I didn't, but it, it hurt him. It felt good to hurt him. Well, when he heard me say that, he took his gear and he slams it down the sink and he goes, that's it, Macbeth, I call you out. And he storms out. I call you out? Like, what, what are we, what are we, in second grade? I mean me by the flagpole. <laughs> Whatever. My squad leader's there with us. And he goes, 
Yeah, you know, Macbeth, you gotta go fight him, right? I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, you gotta go fight him. He called you out in front of the men. People are gonna think you're a wuss if you don't go fight him. Once again, I need to remind you, I was 155 pounds. <laughs> and this guy had been a New York City firefighter. All right, you know what? I can take a punch, right? It's, this is, it's gonna be one of those things where I walk out there, I throw a punch, he throws a punch, and someone steps in between us. Break it up, guys, break it up, break it up. I walk out there to fight him. Good portion of the platoon comes with us to watch. Smitty beat the living crap out of me. <laughs> You know, hit, getting hit by him was like getting hit in the face with a Christmas ham. Like, ow! Like, I saw stars, like explosions, whenever he hit me in the face. I got a couple good ones in, but he just beat me like I owed him money. I think we fought for about three minutes. I might be exaggerating that. It might have been, might have been shorter, but it felt like, felt like a lot. It felt like I went 15 rounds with Apollo Creed. I never fell, but he beat the living crap out of me. And eventually an NCO from another platoon saw us fighting and he ran, bring it up guys, bring it up, you know. And I was there. <laughs> well, you know, he had given me two black eyes. My nose wasn't broken, but it was bleeding, you know, in my mouth, you know. I go up to my squad leader, I'm there, sorry. Why didn't you stop us? And he goes, number one, Macbeth, you need to learn a little bit about the chain of command. And number two, I thought what he did was a bunch of BS. I was hoping you'd beat him up. <laughs> Bleeding, you know. <laughs> but I learned something that day. It didn't really gel at that moment. But I was in the middle of this book called Colin, or called uh, My American Journey by Colin Powell. It was Colin Powell's biography. I was in the middle of that book, and I had just finished The Tao of Pooh. You know, it was, it was a, a book about, like, Win the philosophy of Winnie the Pooh. One of uh, Colin Powell's famous sayings was his ten rules. He has ten rules, like, you know... It's not as bad as you think it'll get better in the morning or get mad and then get over it. And I was thinking like, man, I need rules. I need a couple of rules to live by, like Colin Powell. Not 10, 10 seems a little extravagant. And so I thought of three of them based on my experience having the crap beat out of me. My first rule is release your attachments. You know what I should have done after I put holes in his sleeping bag? I should have given him my sleeping bag or, or bought him another one. It was just a couple hundred dollars maybe, you know. I had the money. I could have just given him the money or traded out my sleeping bag and just dealt with CIF when I had to turn my stuff in. My second rule is learn to suffer. I was cold that night and I should not have wussed out and tried to get killed by NATO so that I could go and get warm. I should have taken that suffering. And my third rule is you are not special. You know, I was fully expecting to go out there, I would throw a punch, you would throw a punch, and my squad leader, I was hoping he would care enough about me that he would stop the fight. And he didn't. I needed to learn a lesson. And one of the lessons I learned was that in the big scheme of things, I'm not special. Release your attachments. Learn to suffer. You are not special. That's, those are Ryan Macbeth's Tau of soldiering. And when I became well, acting first sergeant of my company, I actually printed that out and I put it above the urinals in the men's bathroom because... I was that kind of first sergeant, <laughs> which people are probably rolling their eyes and going, what the heck is this? The towel of soldiering, learn to suffer. 
But I've actually lived by those rules. I, I, I don't have a lot of stuff in my life. I, um, I've embraced suffering with marathons, with triathlons. I need the pain, you know, because I have such an easy life. And I realize in the big scheme of things that I'm not special. I got more years in back of me than I have in front of me. One day I'm going to die and nobody's ever going to remember me. And I'm okay with that. And I think if you live your life by the towel of soldiering, release your attachments, learn to suffer, you are not special, you'll have a much happier life. Thank you for watching.